Hi everybody, today we're going to cover the difference between one gap and two gap fronts or one gap and two gap, gap techniques really in terms of how the defensive line is going to play. Last year, North Carolina played a one gap technique and that's, that's kind of the more traditional 4-3 look. I'm going to show you a, a couple examples of this, but here's one from the uh, Boston College defense and they're in an under formation. It doesn't really matter, but that means the one technique is to the strength of the offensive uh, formation, although it's a pretty balanced offensive formation. But what a one-gap uh, player or assignment is going to be for a player on the, de on the uh, defensive front is the player is going to be responsible for a single gap. So if you look at the offensive line, there are two A-gaps, one in between each uh, side of the center, between the center and the guard. Then you have a B-gap between the guard and the tackle, and you got that on each side. And then you have a C gap between the tackle and the end. So C gap here. And then sometimes if you got a tight end, you got a D gap, right? So the thing is, for any sort of run defense, it's always about run fits. It's about fitting into your gap, and it's about gap control. You have to control each gap because if you leave, let's say this guy is in this gap and this guy is in this gap, that means that, one of those gaps is going to be empty and all of a sudden you're going to see a running back running through that empty gap and that's where you get big plays. If you, if you get a guy out of a gap, he, you're in trouble defensively. So everything is about maintaining gap control, controlling that gap. In a one-gap defense, you see what, what they're in here, you're going to have each player is responsible for one gap. So in this alignment, unless they, they slant, and they won't here, but unless they slant, you're going to see... The nose tackle responsible for this A gap, the three technique, the defensive tackle responsible for the B gap here. That means you're going to have to have a linebacker in this A gap and a linebacker in this B gap. Defensive end is going to be responsible for the C gap here, and then you're going to have the overhang. Your Sam backer is going to be responsible for the D gap out here. And then you have the defensive end and the nine technique responsible for the C there. So that's what you're going to see. And you can see already the backer is telegraphing where his gap's going to be because he's already stepping to the A gap. So now you see that each player is, is, is hitting their gap. And what you're going to try to do in a one gap defense is these front four, and usually a one gap defense is going to be out of a front four, though you can do it out of an odd front. Their job is to try to get as much penetration through their gap, staying under control, but you want to get upfield in that gap as much as possible. And you can see this backer is, is getting penetration. You can see the three technique is trying to get penetration here. That's the job of those, of those players. Now, this backer here is reading his keys. He's responsible for this B gap. But when he sees counter away, he's, he's shadowing that back. When he sees these steps from the offensive line, he sees double team there. He knows he can get to that. He's going to have to get over the top here as quickly as possible to try to make a play. Now, he's going against Dalvin Cook, who's fast, but that's standard one-gap defense. Just trying to control one gap at a time. Now, two-gap defense is a little different, so I'm going to go ahead and pull up Another defensive look here. This is Texas from 2015 against Cal. And you can see they're in a very different alignment here. And one of the differences is if you go back to the, to the BC alignment, you can see pre-snap each player is lined up in a gap. And that's normally what you're going to see with a one-gap one scheme. When you're looking at Texas here, they are lined up head up. This... This nose is in a zero technique. He is over the, the eyes of the center. And essentially what's going to happen here is each of these players, you got four techniques here over the, over the tackle. You got zero, one, two, three, four. Four I is especially difficult. And we'll see a lot of that from North Carolina this year. Especially difficult to run against. But what you're going to see here is when you got guys lined head up like this, oftentimes it's a signal that that guy is responsible not for the one gap that he would have been lined up in as a one gap player, but he's responsible for two gaps. So here, the nose tackle is clearly responsible for both A gaps. 
Now, he's still going to have a primary gap. So you'll see him step, and he's going to try to defend his primary gap first. But what's going to matter, what the difference is, is instead of trying to penetrate into that gap as much as possible, he's going to try to get leverage in that gap with his body and then press back and compress the into the into the other gap with the body of the player who is blocking him. So you're going to try to he's basically going to try to play head up if 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 this was a straight ahead play, he's just going to try to get into the pads of the of the of the guard and kind of shade to this side while using the or of the of the center while using the center's butt to basically force off that that gap. Here you've got outside zone so he's got to step with it. But that's really good play from the nose tackle, by the way. You see him protect his primary gap, anchor, and then get off the block and make the tackle in his secondary gap. That's two-gap football. And you can see out here, same thing. He's got that gap and that gap. He has that gap and that gap. And he's got the B gap and C gap here. What that allows you to do is to play with one backer here who, who's really not responsible for just one gap necessarily he can kind of float and you can also play this guy to the edge a little bit more and he doesn't have to commit to playing this gap hard because he knows he's got a two gapper here who's responsible for that gap as well so he's actually kind of a secondary player he doesn't have a fit so if you've got the players if you've got the bulk this allows you to try to stop the run with fewer players up front in terms of committing to specific gaps. And it allows you a little bit more freedom in the back in the back seven to be able to do some things. Now, you've got to have the players to do it. If you two-gap and your guy can't handle two gaps, then you're just going to have one gap that's free. I'll look at one other, or two other examples of two-gapping here. Here's another one from Texas. This one, they're actually, they slide and they're lined up in the gaps, but then watch what happens with the two tackles. Each of them steps forward and takes on the takes on the blocker head up. He's got both here. He's actually in a one gap. This is a hybrid front. Where you have a combination. Uh, he might have both of these. You're, sometimes you'll have two guys that'll share a gap. And I think he's got uh, primary B, secondary A, and he's got primary A, secondary A here. That's what it looks like. And then what's happening here, he's just stepping down, taking on the block, and then you're going to see those backers scrape to wherever that responsibility isn't. We'll look at one other example. It's from the national championship game a few years ago. This is Florida State on defense, and you can see Timmy Jernigan, the defensive tackle, lined up over the center. You can see the two defensive ends, lined up in a four technique and if you if you watch this is two gap football primary gap secondary gap primary gap secondary gap primary gap secondary gap and what Jernigan does he immediately gets positioned here but he's not trying to penetrate up the field like what you see in a one gap he's trying to block off that with his body and then block off that gap with the offensive player's body. Same thing here, stepping inside to his primary gap, but he's also got a little bit of backside responsibility. And what this does, the design of two-gap football is to really compress space. You're just trying to compress the space so that there's just not much space to get through those gaps. Instead of getting upfield and getting aggressive penetration and trying to make plays in the backfield necessarily, you're trying to make it so that there's just no running room. And this is the goal. This is what you're going to see from North Carolina's defense this year. We can look at, uh, at how we've seen this from Jay Bateman's defense in the past. You can look at North Carolina's defense this year. They're going to do the same thing. Look right here. This is a two-gap assignment. Primary gap, secondary gap. He's going to push back into that secondary gap. And then he's going to make the play in his primary gap. And you notice, again, the goal is just to cause a pileup, essentially, to, to reduce the space and 
eliminate the running lanes while maintaining some flexibility in the secondary. This is something to watch for in terms of a difference from how Carolina ran a very clear one-gap scheme last year, almost never two-gapped. This year, they're going to be two-gapping one or two players on almost every play.